Welcome. My name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of the Norman Williams Public Library, I welcome you to this special World Refuge Refugee Day event. Um, people have been commenting about, about the building. We are very fortunate to have this lovely library in our town. It was built in 1883, so it's more than 140 years old. And um, we appreciate everyone's support who uh, both participate in our programs like this and um, people's generous donations to keep us going. And I also want to just thank the uh, Woodstock Community Television for once again filming our events um, in a week or so. They'll be up on their website and our website, so you can refer your friends or uh, refresh your, your memory of, of what was said here, because I have a feeling there was going to be some very important information shared. Um, this gallery, gathering is co-hosted by the Grace Initiative Global and the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma and Norman Williams Library. And without further ado, because we've got a very full agenda, I'm going to turn the podium over to Yvonne Ladico from Grace, Grace Initiative Global, say that three times fast, <laughs> who will introduce the speakers and the organizations they represent. OK, so thank you so much, Liza, for the introduction. And also thank you to the Norman Williams Library for co-organizing this event. And of course, thank you to the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma. As Liza pointed out, my name is Yvonne Lodico, and I'm the founder and executive director of Grace Initiative Global. It is my pleasure to open this event um, on for World Refugee Day, Strategies for Refugees to Overcome Trauma. Briefly, Grace Initiative Global is a 501c3 Vermont-based nonprofit. Um, it initially began as a program for promoting engagement, dialogue on issues of sustainable peace and humanitarian strategies. In uh, last year, we started to resettle refugees under the Office of Refugee Resettlement Program called Matching Grant. We are resettling um, refugees as an affiliate of Episcopal Migration Ministries. And since March or April of 2023, we have resettled 77 Haitian entrants into Vermont. Uh, these entrants are Haitian humanitarian parolees. They enter the United States legally, and they are able to work. And the goal of this program is economic self-sufficiency. Of course, through this process, and even the process of leaving Haiti, there is a lot of trauma that every single person comes with. And this is one of the reasons for this program today. So World Refugee Day stems from a progression of international law protecting refugees, beginning with the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, and the Convention relating to the status of refugees of 1951, and the Protocol of 1967. In 1971, the United States uh, agreed and incorporated the, um, the Refugee Convention into US international law. And in 1971 was the first year of celebrating World Refugee Day. So in addition to our program for matching grants, which is through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, Grace Initiative will begin to resettle refugees through two other programs, one beginning in the end of July and one that will begin in, at the end of October 2024. This program is called Resettlement and Placement. And so not only will we be accepting Haitian entrants through the matching grant program, we will be resettling refugees from worldwide. So we will be resettling perhaps up to 200 refugees next year in the state of Vermont. So um, <clears throat> that's just a summary of our program, but now I'd like to go forward with the program that we are here for today. Our first speaker is Dr. Richard Molika. He is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and director of the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma. 
at Massachusetts General Hospital. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since 1981, Dr. Malika and HPRT have pioneered the medical and mental health care of survivors of mass violence and torture in the U.S. and abroad. Under Dr. Malika's direction, HPRT conducts clinical, training, policy, and research activities for populations affected by mass violence around the world. Dr. Malika is currently active in clinical research and the development of a global mental health curriculum focusing on trauma and recovery. The Global Mental Health Trauma and Recovery Certificate Program is the first of its kind in global mental health and post-conflict disaster care. He has published over 160 scientific manuscripts, published his first book called Healing Invisible Wounds, Paths to Hope and Recovery in a Violent World. And his most recent publication is A Manifesto, Healing a Violent World. Dr. Motlika received the Equity, Social Justice, and Advocacy Lifetime Achievement Award from Harvard Medical School for his leadership and lifelong service to provide and improve health, mental health care for vulnerable populations experiencing health care disparities. Grace Initiative has been very fortunate to collaborate with the Harvard program, and furthermore, I was even more fortunate because he, Dr. Malika was um, my professor in divinity school. So that's when I started to really learn about trauma. So without further ado, I think we will start the program with Dr. Malika. Thank you. psychologists in, in Vermont, you know, one, wonderful work she's done over the years with torches and labors. So I'm going to try to take you through a little 20 minute quick snapshot of refugee mental health by focusing on the Trump story. But before I get started, I want to congratulate, because I'm also here with my good friend, uh, Father Wismick who is a Haitian uh, priest from Port-au-Prince, who was just named last week by uh, Pope Francis, who loves Haiti, the Bishop of Port-au-Prince. So bravo to Father Wismick, who's a psychologist, a priest, and really one of the great human beings in our field. So I'm very excited to give this announcement that Father Wismick has been named by Pope Francis the Bishop of Port-au-Prince. So we, we celebrate uh, such a charismatic, uh, wonderful human being, you know. And as we say, the Holy Spirit, probably she had some role in this selection, you know. So let's get started. We only have 20 minutes. I'm looking carefully at the clock here. How do we find the person behind the facts? Now, we all know U.S. human rights workers, humanitarian aid workers, doctors, psychologists, etc. And we've got a lot of facts coming at us about refugees, asylum seekers, people at the border, displaced persons. These are facts. But how do we get behind the facts to find a human being. How do we find the human being that is behind these medical facts, these political facts, these racist facts, the fake news facts? How do, how do we find the real human being? And so, in the next slide, and also I want to thank my deputy director, Eugene Augustenberg, who's here, who will be sharing in the discussion for helping me with the slides. Next slide, please, Eugene. So we know the trauma-informed care movement, which has been introduced and spawned by our government, we, we helped to develop this movement. We want to shift the focus when we talk 
talk about traumatized people, whether they're rape victims, uh, traumatized children, bullying, etc., you know, uh, refugees in particular, we want to shift the focus from what is wrong with you to what happened to you. Does that make sense? In other words, not see the refugee, the asylum team, seeker, the torture survivor as a massive pathology. We're trying to find a human being that went through this experience and, and is here in this country seeking help. Next slide. Thank you so much. So the focus is what happened to you? And this is not an easy thing to listen to and discover. Next slide. Now, the, this presentation is usually given to medical doctors, but I think it applies to all of you working in the field of refugees. I call, call this Pandora's box, you know. Pandora was told not to open the box. She opened it and all the terrible things came out, okay? But at the end, she found something important. So if you go to the next slide, The next slide, please. You'll see, next slide, just keep clicking, Eugene, it's kind of automated, yeah. The next slide. So we know in Pandora's box there are these problems for all of us working in the field. There's not enough time to listen to the trauma story. Uh, if you go back to the previous slide, Eugene, if we can keep the previous slide up. Uh, it's not about time. We're afraid if we ask about the trauma story, we're going to disturb the person. Here in this case, we're talking about the patient. This is uh, what primary care doctors say. Or the person might lose control, right? Everybody knows this. You might say, well, how's it going with housing? I say, well, I'm a rape victim. And I can't find any housing out of them on the streets, and, and then they, they go to lose control, which never happens, by the way, but people say this. They, the doctors don't have time. They say, well, I can't, you know, how am I going to stop them telling the story before the end of the appointment? Next slide. Very few of us are trained in how to listen to the trauma story of highly traumatized people. Very few of us are trained, and I know Grace Initiative is working with its colleagues, and Aaron from the car has a big program on this, helping people understand how to listen to the trauma story. Uh, doctors complain that I get paid for it, and they're afraid they may be upset. In other words, if I ask too much of an asylum seeker who's been tortured, I'm going to get upset. And I don't want to be upset because I, I've heard too many of these stories. Next slide, please. So if we go to the next slide. So we know medicine, and uh, we, we this, believe this, Eugene, this is fine. We, we know that, that the WHO has a definition of health. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely absence of disease and infirmity. This is the world of my definition. The next slide, we reject this definition. We don't use this definition. Next slide. Now, this definition was given to us at HPRT by women feminists in India working with young people and women, and here's their definition. Health is a personal and social state of balance and well-being in which people feel strong, active, wise, and worthwhile. Where their diverse capacity and rhythms are valued. Where they may decide and choose, express themselves, and move about freely. This is a fantastic definition, dynamic definition. I love this definition. And I use it in my work. So I hope you take on the Chapman definition of health. Next, next slide, please. And we know that the integrated holistic approach, including the field work you're doing, focuses on a healthy body, healthy mind, 
Healthy Spirit. This is one of the great strengths of the Grace Initiative, Healthy Spirit. And this, this means a respect for personal and community autonomy, freedom from prejudice, racism, and stigma, and social justice. Every refugee is a victim of a human rights violation. In our Cambodian study, they were a victim of 16 human rights violations. 16. So whenever you mention the word refugee, you're talking about people who've been through extensive human rights violations. Next slide. Now I'm going to go into briefly how how do we listen? How, how do we listen and understand and try to help people? Now there's a huge amount of science in my you know hour and a half lecture. I go over all the science about how the trauma story leads to health and well-being. And I don't think you should over an hour and find a trauma story. It's not very treasured. We love looking for gold, but I want to give you some ideas on how we in the field the community health worker, the nurse, the doctor, the psychologist can listen to the suffering of human beings and give them hope. Next slide. Now, the first thing we know when we work with a refugee or asylum seeker or tourist survivor, that we're there too. Every human being experiences, experiences tragedy in their lifetime. No one gets away without having a tragedy in their lifetime. This is inescapable. We're on the same page with the people we're serving. But we also know that a profound pain and fear enters us when we realize that one human being has intentionally hurt another. When a woman is beaten up in domestic violence, when a child is sexually abused, when an asylum person is taken away from the children on the border. It, this is a terrible story of deep pain when one human being hurts another. We're in another league here. I'm at the Italian, Central Italian earthquake zone, and people have a little bit of a different response to earthquake than they do to mass violence and torture. Next slide. Now, we have a great biographer, Prima Levy, who wrote Survival in Auschwitz. She was a young Jewish man put in a concentration camp from Italy, came back, and while he was in the camp, he had this dream. In the camp, he said, all the people in the camp are getting ready to be killed at this dream. It's an intense pleasure, physical, and especially with the home of my friendly people He's having a dream about being home and talking to his sisters and his mother, etc. But I can't help noticing that nobody's listening to me. In fact, they're completely indifferent. They speak confusedly of other things among themselves. If I was not there, my sister looks at me, gets up, and goes away without a word. This is really, I, I almost cry whenever I read this last night. A desolating grief is now born in me. When we don't acknowledge the humanity of someone who's lived through extreme violence, and we turn away and don't listen, a desolating grief is born in them. Next slide. We know the will to deny, to not listen, in all of us is active in the family, friends, the society. We actively reject acknowledging the trauma story and the impact of trauma on the survivor. I'm not going to go into the politics of this. This is a huge discussion, and we'll get into a big argument over this probably. Losing the world comes from the Greek war singing in the great play by Sophocles 2,500 years ago when they find the wounded warrior screaming in agony on an island, I'm a stranger in a strange land. 
the refugee, the asylum seeker, the Turk survivor, everything they believed in has been turned upside down. They never were taught in the family that men could come into the house and rape children in front of them or their spouse in front of them. Everything they believed, their moral values, their social values, their limit, all turned upside down. They lose the world and they have to create a new world. And this is where you come in. You are a co-collaborator in helping the refugee create a new world. It's a beautiful thing. And so many refugees have altruism, resiliency. They, they have the power to find a new world, a better world than what they lived in before. Next slide. <clears throat> And we know that the trauma story is in the body, the symptoms, emotional symptoms, limitations, disability. As Michel Foucault, the great philosopher, French philosopher, said, the body is imprinted by history. Torture is imprinted in our bodies, not just our minds. It's, it's comprehensive in our spirit. Father Wisdom talks about this, and we talk a lot about the Holy Ghost helping us. Yeah, next slide. Now, Eugene, I'm going to run through these quickly. Everyone, this is from Bosnia, Herzegovina, where a terrible war going on, like in the Ukraine. So we're talking about the trauma story. So, someone's telling you a story, you only see this little bit of detail. This is something we made up, a drawing we made up. Next slide, we run through this quickly, and you'll see how we go from the superficial outline to deep, deep, deep into the story. Keep going, Did you just show them all one after another. This is what we end up with. We keep going, next one. Next one. Is this the last one? This is the last. No, go back. Okay, go back. You see, as we heal the trauma story, go back to Eugene. Too. As we heal the trauma story, we go deeper, 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 deeper into the person. Look at this. Isn't that beautiful? Survivor of torture in Bosnia. This is what's lurking behind the trauma story. A whole village of community, family, relationships. Next slide. Go to the next slide, please. And we know the trauma story in my book. I talk a lot about this in this little tiny book, which is only a few dollars, and in my main book, Healing Invisible Wounds. There are four elements to the trauma story the factual accounting of the events cultural meaning of trauma, looking behind the curtain, and the relationship between the person and ourselves. Empathy, listening to the trauma story, empathy, Eugene Augustenberg can go into this with you. Empathy is a huge, huge, huge part. This is where we stay at our training center in Italy, at this beautiful place here. As we say, there's no healing without beauty. We'll talk about that at the end. Next slide. Luda, Eugene can, can help drill deeply into this, listening under, this is from one of our professors, Franco Papra, who Yvonne met. Listening, understanding, deep appreciation, you know, when a listener and a speaker, when a trauma storyteller and the listener are on task, the central nervous system links up. When one is in listening to the other, like in Green Malevi, there's a tremendous disconnect in the brain. The two brains separate and go separate ways. Next one.
And we know that from deep listening and empathy, we actually see in our brains the story of the refugee, the survivor, the target. The story actually, visually, enters our mind if we look for it, what we call the visual image in the mind's eye. And of course, the next slide, the pain can be absorbed by you, the health worker. Here's an example. The refugee patient on the right is very distressed, comes in, talks to the empathic you, the health practitioner. Oh my gosh, all of a sudden, the refugee feels better, and the uh, refugee feels better, <laughs> and the doctor, the nurse, the health, the, you guys feel worse. This has all been demonstrated scientifically. Or the patient, refugee, feels worse, doesn't get any relief, and the doctor feels worse. So this is what they call empathic distress, that having a lot of empathy in dealing with vicarious trauma can lead to a lot of distress in us as the patient transfers their suffering to us. If I was in the room, I'd ask you, how many people right now, raise your hand if you've ever had this experience, raise your hand. Anybody ever had this experience of empathic distress where the patient transferred their suffering to you? Anybody? Have, yeah, I mean, it's, kind of, it's a common experience, right? Next slide. Now, I'm going to spend a few minutes in the trauma story and we'll be done. So, when you listen to the trauma story, look how you go from isolation, like in Primo Levi's story of the dream, to love. I love this little drawing, and I use it all the time because it gives me hope about humanity that people can't listen to each other, share trauma, share suffering, and help each other through deep listening and empathy. Next slide. And we know from the neurosciences, I don't have time to go over this, that partly in order to listen to a story of a refugee, you need to have a safe and secure space. You can't do this on the streets, in a car, in a bus. You need it in a supermarket. You need a safe and secure space. That's the interior simulated cortex. Building trust is the oxytocin, which lowers, you know, the amygdala is the bully boy that once it gets activated by trauma, yeah, because, you know, the trauma response fear, you run away, fight, fight, flight, or frozen. And the, the, uh, that the amygdala, once it takes over, they, people can't tell the stories. They're too upset. I mean, you know, I just had a torch survivor. I defended in the courtroom, who every time he was asked a question, he thought the people in the courtroom were trying to kill him. His amygdala took over. And we know in cooperation, we turn off the amygdala, we open up the frontal cortex, and the love hormones come out, oxytocin, you know, projects into the hippocampus, and all of a sudden we feel good. Someone's listened to me. Someone's heard my story. I feel, I feel accepted. I feel valued. My dignity has been respected. It's a fantastic thing. This is a love hormone <laughs> called oxytocin. Next slide. So when you listen to the trauma story, you're not searching for buried treasure. You're not trying to rip it out of the patient or the asylum seeker in your work, saying you're a community health worker or you're visiting someone in your house. You're just open to listen. But we also know that as community health workers, for instance, or nurses or doctors, whatever, we have to prepare someone by reducing the amygdala, the limbic response. The amygdala is a bully boy that will take care of and will run the show. It will not let any new information come into the person. 
Because people are so upset, they're so aroused, they're triggered, they, they can't listen, they can't learn, they can't study. So these are all the things at HPRT we discovered help reduce the bully boy, turn off the amygdala, and help with deep listening. Deep breathing. Every one of you should know how to do deep breathing. Deep breathing 100% should be taught to everybody in the refugee field. The refugee, the community health worker, the staff, the secretary, the nurse, the doctor. Deep breathing is essential. It's easy to do, easy to learn, and uh, Karen from the Caro and uh, Yvonne and others can teach you how to do deep breathing. You should do it every day. Before you see a patient, a refugee, do some deep breathing. Have them do deep breathing. Walk in nature is huge, 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 and you live in a beautiful state of Vermont. God. You walk out the door and you, you, you got the healing power of nature. Chair yoga for older people, elderly, music, listening to birds. I like to listen to bird songs. Prayer, mindfulness, uh, you know, this is something uh, Yvonne does with her group. Healthy diet, swim in a warm pool, and then of course, when people are over aroused, triggered, hyped up, full of fear, anxiety, depression, medication could be a miracle drug as well. These are all the things you can do, including yourself, to reduce the stress of your work and the stress of listening to trauma stories. Next slide. I'm almost done. My 20 minutes are almost up. Next slide, Eugene. And here is a beautiful graph I made very few doctors know this, know anything about this. When a patient, A, go back to A please, go back to that grip. When a patient, A, I'll wait for the grip to come back to you. Eugene, can you put that, yeah. When a patient, A, right there, look at A, has high limbic arousal from violence, homelessness, distress, etc. They can't tell the story. The amygdala takes over and says, no, it's too disturbing. You can't tell your story. As you reduce the limbic arousal, B, storytelling gets a little bit better. When you get to see, you, you know, that's where most people are at. They can tell a little bit of the story, you know. And we have a saying, my wife introduced me to this, she's a primary care doctor, a little bit, a lot over a long period of time. Sometimes people can only tell a story for five minutes. Then the next time you see them, another five minutes. Then the next time you see them, another, and then they're over here. You've heard the whole story. You don't have to rush it. D is very good, and then finally E, people singing songs and dancing and, and telling, uh, they're great storytellers. Great to people. How many refugees you know are fabulous storytellers? Because they reduce the limbic response way down, very low, and they're able to connect with you around their story. So, you know, when you listen to people through empathy, Luda, Sometimes people are not ready, they're too aroused, they're too hyped up, they're too stressed out. Doctors don't know this. We have to teach doctors how through deep breathing, walking in nature, chair yoga, stuff like that, how people can be ready to share traumatic life events which need to be listened to. Yeah, next slide, we're almost done now. And I'll ask uh, Yvonne, next slide, There seems Here's to be a bit of a, 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 excuse me, seems to be a bit of a delay when I change the slides. They must not be changing That's the first okay. slide. Okay, we're done. Okay. Yeah, we're done. So okay. in the next slide, the trauma story pocket card, Yvonne can print out and show with you. Here's the 15 steps for listening to the trauma story. 15 steps. We do 
could know this in training. And I hope Yvonne can uh, offer you these pocket cards. At the end, Father Wisbeck and I, we said to the Vatican, because we built a center for Haitian women and children that's recently been built, a beautiful, gorgeous place with a bird sanctuary, a garden, meditation, church, uh, therapy rooms, etc. We built it, and we're working on this now. That there's no healing without beauty. There's no healing without beauty. We have to bring beauty back into the lives of people who have been damaged by violence. So we'll end with this. Next slide, Eugene, if you could just show the next slide. Oh, this is what Pandora found in Pandora's box after all the crazy stuff, terrible stuff came out. Oh, we need to create narratives, especially for children and adolescents and young adults of hope. We can't be hitting them with all kinds of negativity. The world is one big hell of a negative place and we have to give hope, not false hope, real hope, to our humanity, through respecting their dignity, to these young people. So I'm going to leave with that, and you can look at my work, The Healing Invisible Wounds, Eugene, you can just show them the documents, and the bottom, I'm done. Here's my book. You can get on Amazon. I'm not trying to sell it, by the way. Next slide. And here's a wild manifesto that I wrote in the Italian tradition. You know, the will to survive, the will to heal, to survive an apocalyptic world, a violent world, healing in a violent world. You know, it's a manifesto. It's not about science. It's about speaking truth out and building a beautiful world. So, Yvonne, thank you. I think, uh, I don't know if there are any questions or comments, but I did my 20 minutes. Uh, I'm on time. Thank you, Richard. We are going to have question and answer period after the presentations. So I think that would give people more time to think about your presentation and questions they would like to ask. Um, I wanted to bring out that the Grace Initiative Global was conceived for people coming out of conflict or strategies for rebuilding after conflict. So Grace is an acronym, Governance, Rec Reconciliation, Agriculture, and Coexistence. At the same time, it's also the word grace, which means love. And this is something you need to find, as Richard brought out in his presentation, to finally heal and transcend from conflict. We just can't call ourselves the Love Initiative and be in Vermont. <laughs> so um, we are, um, that's why we are a Grace Initiative. Our next speaker is Karen Fondacaro, a PhD. She is a professor emerita in the Department of Psychological Science at the University of Vermont. Over the past 40 years, Dr. Fondacaro's clinical work and research has focused on the mental health of survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and political conflict. In 2007, Dr. Fondacaro established Connecting Cultures, a clinical science program designed for the needs of refugees, immigrants, and asylum seekers. In 2009, she co-founded NEST, New England Survivors of Torture and Trauma. These programs collaborate with numerous community organizations and provide new Americans from over 30 countries of origin with psychological, legal, and physical therapy services and medical referrals. Dr. Fondacaro has been the principal investigator on federal grants, um, Agency of Human Services, ORR, NIH, SBIR. I don't know what they all mean. She conducts numerous national and international presentations, a TED Talk, and has published peer-reviewed scholarly articles on refugee well-being. 
In 2020, Dr. Fonda Caro and the Connecting Cultures NEST program received the Regional Kellogg Foundation Community Engagement Scholarship Award. So without further ado, Dr. Fonda Caro. But I'm going to um, talk a little bit about interventions that we do do in, um, in Vermont for refugees and immigrants and asylum seekers. And so first I was going to talk a little bit about our programs, um, Connecting Cultures and NEST, as Yvonne said, and then talk a little bit about trauma-informed care, the importance of the cultural context, and also the limitations of PTSD, what does that stand for? Post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll tell you why that title annoys me, but I'll tell you that when I get there. And also, then I'm going to tell you about the two treatment frameworks that we do use when we're working with refugee children and families, and also when we're working with adults. Just to give you an idea of what it is that we do. I do two like full day trainings when I'm teaching clinicians how to implement the interventions and then we provide supervision for years. So this is really a snapshot of what we do. So this is the Connecting Cultures program and we started out in 2007, you know, fast forward 17 years, we started with just psychological services but realized that when someone comes in for mental health services, it's important to look at them holistically, and Dr. Malika mentioned that. So the very first client that I had that was a refugee who I was gonna, you know, ready with my intervention to do some treatment for mental health treatment for trauma, and he looks at me, he was a young man from Sudan, and he said, I know I have, the, I have that post-traumatic stress thing, but I also haven't eaten in two days. So it became very clear very quickly to us that we had to have case management services. Does someone have housing? Does someone have employment? Have, are they food secure? So we partnered with the UVM um, social work department. So we're in the social work department has partnered with us and also the psychology department for the trauma services and we work together. We also work with cultural brokers those are individuals who many are refugees themselves from different countries, and they teach us the cultural context. And we work together with cultural brokers and a therapist together, cultural brokers and a social work together. We've also partnered with the Vermont Law School and um, Vermont Asylum Assistance Program because many refugees and immigrants and certainly asylum seekers have legal needs. So we've really got all these different components and we all try to meet and um, we're in different organizations but we really work well together. We also have a physical therapy component because many folks who've been tortured have some kind of chronic pain and receiving physical therapy services is critical. And you want someone who has expertise in knowing how to treat a torture survivor. The first time, I went into a physical therapy office. Is that my phone going off? Oh, I was going to say. It. Um, the first time I went into a physical therapy service um, office and was thinking about this office providing physical therapy services, and I saw some of the machinery that just was so scary looking. We had to have a big talk about how would we change the office around to provide services to someone who may have experienced electrical. Uh, stimulation as a form of torture. So, um, but we've been working together for years now and this is our program and these are basically the different components of it. We have to do community outreach. We did community outreach for two years before we ever provided services. Did not expect that people would be coming into the clinic, but after two years we had waiting lists of over a hundred folks at a time. We continue to do community outreach. We have a satellite office at the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, in Burlington, Vermont. We also do research and direct clinical services, like I said before, and also we do lots of trainings and presentations. So what is trauma-informed care? The important thing about trauma-informed care is that you're using a lens 
of trying to understand someone's trauma. So that when a child or a youth is in a school classroom and they're spacing out or they're doing something that may often be seen as bad behavior, it's not necessarily bad behavior. It could be that they're dissociating based on something that they've witnessed, maybe the death of a family member or something. So to really, really look through a trauma lens of what might be happening with someone's behavior. And the same thing, same thing with adults, which is that it's not the adult who is disordered, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not the adult who's disordered. It's the war. It's the conflict that's disordered. What has happened to these individuals is what's disordered. And they're having a normative, very normative response at times to some very serious disordered events that have happened in their lives. Does that make sense to people? Um, so one thing about PTSD is that not everybody ends up with post-traumatic stress disorder. And post-traumatic stress disorder, for those who don't know, is really includes when someone's having flashbacks of the events. They're seeing the nasty things that have happened to their family members or loved ones um, in front of their face again. They're reliving it. They're um, having trouble with their mood and their thoughts about the world just being a completely negative place in response to some of these things have occurred. So post-traumatic stress has a number of criteria for someone to meet it, but not every refugee or survivor of torture meets diagnostic criteria for PTSD. So it's tricky because often when people think about what do people experience, they think, oh, they must have PTSD. But it's very important that we look more holistically at the whole person and what their experiences are and what they are saying their experiences are. OK, so um, in the refugee population, you get about 31% of individuals who end up with post-traumatic stress. So you've got almost 70% of folks who don't end up with what we call full-blown PTSD. We also see depression in about 31%, and many suffer from some kind of anxiety concerns. The other thing about a trauma lens, and Dr. Malika mentioned it, is the impact on the providers, and not just professional providers. We have volunteers who work. Everyone can be impacted in a way that can be traumatizing when working with this population. It's very important that people know how to do self-care, that they support one another in this work. So the other thing um, is to keep in mind cultural influences. We have to look at the cultural context. We come from many different cultures. Over 30 different countries of origin are the individuals that we've been working with. And I'm just going to briefly say that people from other cultures may not have the same understanding that we do in Vermont about um, what is mental health. And so we hear things like, my heart hurts, my head is overwhelmed, problems with my heart-mind connection. Not, I need to come and see a psychologist once a week in a one-on-one -on -one setting. It's not seen in the same way. We did uh, focus groups with a number of different cultures and asked people, what does mental health mean to you? What do you think the number one response was? What does mental health mean in your culture? The number one response was, it means that you're crazy. So people are really seeing sort of the major mental illness and when someone's experiencing psychosis. So it's really important to know what someone is ex how someone is perceiving what mental health is, if you're going to provide services to them, for sure. Lots of somatic complaints, because again, in other cultures, you don't necessarily see things through uh, the same lens that, in terms of what mental health is. So somatic complaints are, I have a stomach ache, I have a headache, and that people will more likely express those kinds of things when they've been traumatized. And then the meaning of mental health or what causes it, we do hear things like our ancestors are upset with us or different causes 
like um, there's a spiritual possession of this person. So really understanding where a person's coming from before we can work with them on trauma and mental health pieces. And there are cultural barriers to help seeking. In this kind of work, we have to deal with spirituality, not something prior to working with refugees that I really brought into the room or into my work, but it's very important to really listen to someone's spiritual needs and interests. And then knowing the different holidays that people are interested in, also knowing what traditional healing practices have worked for them. And I don't have time to show you our jumping doctor, but that's a jumping doctor is a it's a term used for an individual who is chosen by the community in um, in Bhutan, and the jumping doctor helps to heal folks who are sick, and it could be mental health or it could be physical, but it's a very fascinating way, and that people still use it in Vermont, too, in the Nepali-Bhutanese communities. So, um, and I also put Bhutanese mental health rates of suicide, and that's another thing that's really important when you're working with people who have trauma and mental health concerns is that to know if there's anything specific to their culture that we should be watching out for. And we did some studies with the Nepali um, Bhutanese. It turns out that they have two times the rate of suicide than the general US population. So something we have to keep in mind, for sure, when we're working with folks. And also, though, interestingly, I think, is that their ideation, which is really common um, in the US that people have thoughts of hurting themselves, even if they don't have a plan. But in the Nepali Bhutanese community, their ideation is actually lower. So they may not be expressing thoughts. So we have to find creative ways to ask them about their potential to hurt themselves in some situations. So um, there's a whole um, class we do on talking to people about that um, when they're at higher risk. So now I'm going to turn to the two programs that we do use um, for refugee families and then also for, for adults. So this is the, a trauma-informed care, trauma systems therapy for refugee youth and families, TSTR. Okay, so we have a grant with Boston Children's Center, um, and we work also with ALV, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. We have a cultural broker and a clinician who works with the child in one of four tiers. So here are the four tiers and four really important different tiers that different people are gonna need depending upon how they've responded to the trauma that they've experienced pre-migration, during the journey, and post-migration in resettlement. So this first tier on the bottom is community engagement. I'll go through each one of them very um, quickly. But the first one is community engagement, and that's really where we're just we're talking to groups of parents from different refugee groups about we have this program that you might want your child to be a part of. Really engaging, that's the outreach piece, engaging with the community. Um, and parent education groups about trauma. Nothing said about mental health in tier one. Tier two, the same thing. These skills-based school groups, so the kids come together in school and talk about what's it like to be a refugee in a different country and nothing about mental health. However, we can sort of spot those kids who are having more trouble. So this is really non-stigmatizing. We're not talking about there's anything wrong with you. It's really talking about what's it like being a refugee in, in this school? What are the good things about it? What are the challenges? And we can also therefore identify who needs tier three. And tier three is where you do one-on-one -on -one counseling with the child or the youth, and you also have contact with their parents. And then the fourth uh, tier is when there's some kind of a safety issue in the home, if there may be domestic violence or some kind of uh, challenges where the parents really need assistance, then we're gonna provide the services in home, and that's the most um, intense 
service. Okay, so that's trauma systems therapy. And we do that with the guidance of Boston Children's Hospital, the ones who uh, really developed the program initially. And we also work with cultural brokers from many different countries. Okay. And then we also, did you say 505? I said, uh, you could go to 515. 515? Oh, I got. Well, prefer 510. <laughs> I got tons of time. Okay, so we also have a number of adults who they sign up for our wait list and want to come in just as an adult themselves and want services, right? So we looked at the mental health studies. If you look at any mental health studies on refugees, they'll say post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, somatic symptoms, alcohol, and substance use. These are the most common that you'll see in the literature. Again, the idea that someone has gone through their journey, this traumatic journey, this horrific experience and comes to our offices and we say you have a disorder it just feels so not okay <laughs> so we don't use the term um, disorder even though that's what our mental health system is set up that you um, are tied to certain numbers and that this is what you've got so we really um, don't look at it as a disorder no matter what it is that somebody comes in with and what we actually see when people come into our rooms is resilience. And we see incredible strength. What people have gone through in that journey, people who've gone through the Darien Gap, people who've gone through um, horrific journeys to actually make it here. And what we see, too, is that these are individuals coping with grief over loss of family members, loss of their culture and home. People miss their homes. There's a language barrier. There's a new culture to get used to. There's unemployment, finding a job. You may have been a physician over in your country, but that's not going to necessarily transfer. Okay. Also, loss due to the pandemic, when the pandemic was going on. Uh, loss of professional identity. Like I said, you may have um, a very different job if you're an attorney over in your um, country. You're not, you're not certified um, to be an attorney here. Uh, tra trauma and torture experiences, and people do experience traumatic stress, the flashbacks and whatnot. And what we find is that this is chronic. It's not post, like post-traumatic stress disorder would suggest. It's chronic. It's ongoing. It doesn't end when people come here, yay. I mean, people feel, yay, I'm alive. Yay, I'm safe. I'm not going to get killed tomorrow. However, that ends pretty quickly, and people see that even going to the mailbox, it brings bills, it brings um, messages at times that people just weren't used to in their own home countries. So what we did to this PTSD thing is we got rid of the D, got rid of the P, and we call it the chronic traumatic stress intervention. And we developed an intervention for adult refugees. And as I said, there's limitations to the post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. So what we came up with is the chronic traumatic stress is not a disorder, but rather the contextual experience of persistent traumatic events, both past and current or continued, that occur at any point across the lifespan and are perceived by the individual as impairing, regardless of do they meet the criteria based on what our diagnostic system says. And just to very briefly show you, this is our model that we developed so that we could develop an intervention. And we use it to guide our research and our clinical work. But if you look at the left side, we're looking at past and current war trauma and political conflict. We're looking at post-migration living difficulties, which are I don't have a car, my employment's not able to feed my family, those kinds of things, and also daily stressors. And our outcomes, we're also looking at more positive and challenging things that people are struggling with, okay? And if you're, and this 
section in the middle here is we don't want to forget the individual, but we also want to look at the family, the community, and their culture and spiritual spirituality. And interestingly, when you do one-on-one -on -one treatment, usually in sort of US populations, somebody will come in, they know sort of how mental health works. Often when we're working with refugees, we have the whole family in the waiting room. So much more collective societies. And so if you just look through a PTSD lens, this is what you get past. You're only looking at the individual and you're only looking at their traumatic stress symptoms. We need a more holistic model um, in order to really remember that we're working um, from all these different aspects of a person and their community. So we did develop the chronic traumatic stress intervention. And in addition to the intervention, we got an NIH SBIR grant, which is um, a small business innovation research grant. Not that that means anything other than we developed an app. Because when you go into mental health treatment, uh, it's not that one hour a week that helps people. It's that they have to practice things during the week. And typically, we have people writing down things. There's a language barrier. So we developed an app that's a language-free mental health app that goes with our treatment. And I can't show you all the fun things about the app, but I'll just show you some aspects of it. But so there are 10 different modules that we do in our treatment. And down here in number nine is narrative exposure and the life path exercise. That's where we're listening to the story. But we don't listen to the story right away. It's very similar to what Richard said in terms of nobody asked for this story. We want to give them control over who they're telling, when they're telling, when they're feeling trusting. So we first go through these nine modules. Number one is we have a mental health discussion. What's mental health look like in your country? Well, this is what it looks like in the US, and this is what we do in Vermont. Second one is safety. No one wants to tell their story when they're not feeling safe in the therapy room, in their lives. So really having a discussion about that. We have exercises that we do. Um, we act, we've published an article on this um, intervention, and um, there's the publication down there. Um, third is values, not what's wrong with you, but what's important to you. Despite everything that's happened, how are we going to assist you in living a rich life? Then we go through coping skills, deep breathing. We go through cha uh, chair yoga. I'm laughing because I, you know, Richard brought up many of the things that, that we do under our coping skills module. Then we do sleep hygiene. People who've been traumatized don't sleep well. And so we have a whole section on sleep. And then we do working with thoughts. Again, I could spend a lot of time on each of these. Acceptance and tolerance of emotions. The emotions you feel when you've been hurt by another human being in the way that torture survivors and refugees have are very intense. And being able to tolerate the intensity is, is a challenge. And then we do do um, what is a narrative exposure technique, which is the telling of the story. And there's a whole technique around how that is done that I unfortunately can't go into today. But then I did want to say that I'm very excited that the Boston Medical Center contacted me, and they said that we have a number of um, Haitian women who we'd like to try out the chronic traumatic stress treatment with your app. We'd like to try that out. They have since run four groups, and I've got a sneak peek at some of the data, and it's really looking good. And we'll be publishing an article together about how those groups went. And here is, do I have a minute to talk about the app or no? I don't. So here is the app, and there it is. <laughs> and we did, we did a, very, um, a very brief pilot testing of it, too. And the results that we got were a decrease in depressive symptoms, decrease in anxiety, an increase in coping skills in a very short period of time. And people really did use the app. So I'm going to end right there. Thank, Thank you. you. So much.
just going to introduce our next speaker. We're really quite uh, privileged that she has also made quite a long journey to come here. This is Ashley Reed. She's from the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. I know most refugees have heard of USCIS. Um, and she is a community relations specialist in the um, New York field office in Albany, Vermont, and Erie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ashley. Hi, thank you so much for having me today, Yvonne, and um, to Grace Initiative. I have to say it's exciting to hear that Grace Initiative has already kind of brought in and helped resettle 70 plus immigrants, and next year we'll be doing 200. Um, that's quite a feat to increase your numbers that much between one year. Um, but it's very exciting because the agency that I work for, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, or USCIS as we're known in most immigrant communities, is the federal agency that processes applications for refugees, for asylum seekers, um, for whether you're outside the U.S. or inside the U.S. Um, we also process applications for permanent residents or what are known as green cards um, and U.S. citizenship. So this past month, I've been traveling to different World Refugee Day celebrations around New York, Pennsylvania, and now I was able to come to Vermont um, to speak with immigrants in the communities um, and observe the new refugee communities coming in and seeing how welcomed they are by the older refugee communities. Um, I went to one in Rochester, New York, and we had a refugee community from Bosnia who came over in the 90s. They were very excited to welcome the new groups from Afghanistan and Ukraine and, and talking to them about different areas of Rochester. And um, So really, it's all of a community effort. There's our part as a federal government, but there's also a big part as community. Um, and so we try to work with those in the community, whether it's organizations, the immigrants themselves, and that is part of my job is to go out and speak to immigrants and organizations, answer questions. Um, sometimes people hear diff about different policies that are coming out for, regarding immigration and really make sure that people know the correct information. Um, and just something to think about real quick um, is that if you consider that come over each year and last year, just refugees, we had 125,000 people, and this year we hope to bring in 125,000 people. That's not all of the immigrants that come in to America. There's asylum seekers um, who actually come into the U.S. or come to the borders. There's also people who come through family relationships, and all of those different types of immigrants kind of serve one big purpose of making our country better. Um, if you think about immigrants who have come to the U.S., the Google co-founder, um, Sergey Brin, he came from Russia as a child. Um, Shobani Yogurt, I met him just a couple weeks ago in Utica, New York. He came from Turkey. Um, and you think about Mila Kunish, she came from Ukraine, Gloria Stefan, Cuba. You have people in the entertainment industry, the business industry, that have all come over as refugees or as asylum seekers. And really, you know, they've succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. So if you can give any support to refugees as they come in, you never know how they will succeed. And perhaps they can even help others who come in after succeed. Um, just a quick note also is for refugees and other immigrants, once they've had their permanent residence for five years, they can apply for US citizenship. Um, and it's a process. They need to learn how to read English, write English, and they have to learn US history and civics questions that many of us who went to school here in the US have forgotten by the time we become adults. And so they really work hard to go through this process and achieve that level of US citizenship. Um, and I do have some pamphlets um, about the citizenship process. I also have a little red books with all the history questions. If you'd like to see the questions that people do have to learn to study and um, become a US citizen, then I'm happy to give those out. But just one little part before I close is 
Um, before I was involved as community relations, I did interviews for citizenship. Um, and there was a gentleman who had come from Vietnam as a refugee back in the 70s. And he was in his 70s about eight years ago, and he applied for a US citizenship seven times before he passed. People talk about the resiliency, determination of refugees, and he was beyond excited when he finally passed. And all of the officers that had interviewed people that day were clapping as we watched him walk down the hallway when he did pass, because a lot of us had interviewed him at one point. Um, but it was just wonderful to see the emotion and the tears and the joy that came from him completing his process and being able to move forward. Um, so as you help immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, or anyone else, just remember that step that they may take if they want, and remember the joy that they may feel um, as they struggle through the different parts of adjusting to life in America. Thank you.